Nearly 80% of teachers assign online homework to their students, yet many children still do not have internet at home. Helping families get connected is important to Cox Communications. If your child receives free school lunch, your family may be eligible to receive a discounted computer and internet service. To find out if you qualify, contact your school or visit connecttocompete.org slash Cox. Brought to you by Cox Communications and our partners. Now you've got the agenda on your seat. Uh, we will begin promptly at 7.02 and we will work very hard to adjourn by 9 p.m. Uh, and uh, I would also especially like to thank Matt, our videographer from Cox Cable. Matt will be filming this tonight uh, as he has the previous three uh, forums we've had and all of those recordings are available to be viewed on our uh, city's website, onelakewood.com. And believe it or not, people are watching them. And I know that because they comment on them. So if you miss something and you doze off, don't worry, you got a second shot at it uh, when we put it on the, on the website. Uh, so uh, I would like to acknowledge two members of city council that I believe are here tonight. Cindy Marks, I think you're in the back, and Sam O'Leary. Uh, Cindy is at large, and Sam O'Leary is Ward 2 Councilman. So thank you for joining us tonight. And I'm not aware of any other elected officials that are here. If I missed anyone? Oh, very good. Uh, and I would like to also ask the Lakewood Hospital trustees who are here to stand and be recognized as well. So uh, thank you for joining us tonight. And, and four of them are going to speak in, in just a moment here. And now this is our fourth community forum on the future of healthcare in Lakewood. And uh, we have, and City Council has actually had and hosted more than a dozen public meetings on this subject with plenty more to come. Our first forum on January 28th provided an overview of the proposed healthcare delivery uh, that would transition from an inpatient model to an outpatient model. Our second forum on February 11th reviewed the strategic options and the partner options that were considered by the trustees. Our third forum on March 11th focused on the clinical health care delivery strategy offered by the Cleveland Clinic. And tonight, we will focus on what is probably the least understood aspect of this proposal, which is the yet to be, perform yet to be formed new community foundation. We call this, for a placeholder, the Lakewood Community Wellness Foundation. And this Community Wellness Foundation is not to be confused with the Liquid Hospital Foundation. And there have been many conversations where, in fact, those two have been mixed up or considered one and the same. They are not. The Hospital Foundation has its own purpose, uh, which is to provide philanthropic support for the Lakewood Hospital. It will remain a separate foundation with, its, uh, with an evolving mission. The Lakewood Community Wellness Foundation, placeholder name, uh, would be funded with $24 million at the initial stages of the implementation of the proposed healthcare strategy. And an additional $8 million uh, will be paid over several subsequent years to a total of $32 million available for investment and reinvestment in our community. So just to be clear, uh, we're discussing tonight a brand new foundation whose mission, governance, membership, and objective have yet to be determined. Uh, we do know that it really is designed to deal with wellness as we choose to define it ultimately, and we're gonna hear more about what that could mean tonight, uh, but we're all really at the very beginning stages of learning what this is. I don't think there are any experts in the room other than our panelists who know a little bit about wellness, a lot about wellness actually, and a lot more about foundations. Now some of you may have had prior experience with these, and your experience in our community will be a welcome addition to the conversations that come ahead. Now, the major healthcare goal for our country is to prevent bad health. And we must do so in a manner uh, that we've never done so in the past. And if bad health happens to come at us, we have to catch it early. And we have to do so to increase the effectiveness of our sick care and we have to lower costs. Those are major goals. We probably all agree on those costs, or on those goals. Now, we have grown to understand that much of our healthcare system needs to focus in Lakewood in particular on the chronic conditions that affect our quality of life, our economic productivity, and have a really negative effect on the, the pocketbook of our, of our households, especially our middle class households. And the fact is, here in, in Ohio especially, we do not know what we mean by preventative care. And there's a good reason we don't, we don't know that. And the reason is that Ohio ranks dead last, dead last, on the value it gets from public health and prevention spending in the nation. 50 out of 50 states. 
We don't do prevention well, and actually you may have some thoughts on that from your perspective, other than these pockets of brilliance we're gonna hear more about, but as a public, public uh, strategy, uh, prevention has not been a hallmark of our state. In fact, we rank 44th out of 50 in our unavoidable emergency department visits by Medicare enrollees. So some of the major cost drivers are a function of the fact that we don't do enough ahead of the curve of, of uh, prevention, and that's an Ohio story. So as a practical matter, we're not used to seeing in our, in our society around us, in our region, much of what we need, need to see, and uh, we're here to talk about tonight. In fact, one public health official called Ohio a poster child for the consequences of the lack of inve investment in preventative care. Now, Lakewood is like most communities in Ohio. We have a lot to learn about becoming healthier. So tonight we have a, an opportunity to learn how we can make a major step forward towards becoming one of the healthier communities, if not the healthiest communities in the region, in the country. And what a great goal. I think we'd all agree everybody wins if we could achieve that. So tonight we will start our evening by hearing from four trustees of the Lakewood Hospital Association. They have each been given three minutes to share a key thought that is important to them about the proposal they, along with 19 other trustees, have placed before this community for consideration. So I'd like uh, to start with Becky Patton. Becky is a professor of uh, nursing, clinical nursing at Case Western Reserve uh, School of Nursing. She has a long and storied career in healthcare and was a, a very effective uh, contributor as we uh, grew to understand the issues facing uh, our, our city and our region. So Becky, thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, everybody. I guess the other thing I'd want you to know about me is that uh, I've been a registered nurse now for almost 35 years. Went to school at Kent State, got my graduate degree at Case Western Reserve, and um, moved to Lakewood in 1985 and made this my home. I've been a homeowner since 1989. And so um, I'm very much vested into this uh, community. The other thing I will tell you about me is that um, I have worked for the UH Health System for almost 20 years. Um, as the professor at Case Western Reserve, I have students in 13 of the hospitals here in Cleveland. So every day I'm in my car driving to the different hospitals, uh, including Lakewood. I have a student in the operating room there. So I have really a great view of what's happening in our city and seeing what are the resources available to us. The other thing I will share with you is that for four years, from 2006 to 2010, I was considered the chief nurse of the United States. I was the president of the American Nurses Association, which was a full-time job. I commuted back and forth to DC. And I will tell you that during that time, I really got to know about healthcare in the United States and beyond. And it did give me, I guess, a view that not a lot of people understand as to what are the trends, what are happening. And as I would come home, I could see where the opportunities were for here in Lakewood. You know, when we made this decision, I will tell you as, as a member of the board, deliberating this from the very beginning of the process, um, we get nothing. I get nothing out of this. I don't get a job promotion. I mean, I watch the paper and I read what people are saying about us as trustees. I will tell you, I get no health insurance from the Cleveland Clinic no life insurance from the Cleveland Clinic for doing this. The only thing I get from the decision that we made is the confidence to know we're doing what's right for the citizens of Lakewood, okay? So I'm not gonna have a better job. I'm not gonna get any political appointment for doing what we did. And from the very first board meeting I sat in on, I will tell you, because I have a business sense, I've held a lot of director level, chief nursing level positions in my career is I looked at the budget, I looked at the volume, and I looked at are we able to deliver the quality of care we need to deliver. And my concern was immediately from the beginning was there's not enough resources, budget, to sustain our organization long term and assure that the citizens really get what they need. So I have no difficulty standing in front of you telling you that this is the right decision for our community. We do need to think ahead and be focused on what should our future look like. The bricks and mortar, the bricks and mortar really won't define us as, an, as a city. It's the programming. And I think that the wellness concept that we're going to create is where we need to go. Thank you.
Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Gary Pritz. Gary, I know you're in the middle there. Uh, Gary is a, is a long-standing uh, consultant, primarily focused on uh, uh, practice care, IT-related issues that promote the effectiveness of doctor's office performance. And he, uh, he has an extensive business background in addition to that and brought all that to the table for the trustees. Gary? Thank you. And I uh, appreciate your time and attention. And uh, there's really so much to say. And uh, I uh, will, in the interest of time, keep uh, to the best of my ability to that three minutes. Uh, you know, first of all, I just want to say uh, that I, I uh, want to express uh, my appreciation for all the employees of Lakewood Hospital. Uh, particularly now, uh, you know, uh, for, uh, including the one that took care of my wife uh, just today as she had a mammogram, uh, a, uh, a very caring technician who's taken care of her for, uh, for multiple years. And uh, I just uh, want to uh, particularly thank them in this time of uncertainty and angst as they're just uh, waiting and uncertain uh, uh, and concerned for their job. So I just want to express my tremendous appreciation for, uh, for all of those uh, people in this, uh, in this time of transition. Uh, about uh, six years ago, I uh, uh, you know, came on to the board and uh, spoke to the folks at uh, City Council about what my vision was for, you know, is there anything that I could contribute to Lakewood Hospital? And so uh, I shared with them thoughts that I had about trying to introduce measures of uh, lifestyle modification, of uh, change in, in improving uh, wellness. Uh, so so that, that was my vision when I got involved. And so the first thing that I did was uh, take a look at this big uh, briefing <coughs> book uh, in preparation for my first meeting and going through the financial statements. Now this was in 2009, shortly after, you know, in the midst of the uh, financial crisis. You all caught, kind of remember what the stock market was doing back then. But anyway, so I was looking at these things and I was shocked to see that the uh, assets had decreased by $25 million. Uh, I was stunned. Uh, and so I got in, you know, because of uh, investments, so investments plummeted, which, uh, you know, happened to uh, everybody, and in addition, operating losses. And so from the very beginning, any notion of investments in uh, wellness were uh, just simply not feasible as we uh, struggled to uh, try to uh, right the hospital, and, and we've been able to stabilize it uh, so that uh, we're not bleeding at the moment. But. Uh, uh, we haven't really had any opportunity to focus on this notion of uh, wellness and promotion of health until now. Uh, and so, so I hope that that's, uh, this opportunity to uh, restructure, uh, you will provide an opportunity. Now, there's so much to say. Let me just focus, uh, you know, we've talked about uh, reducing chronic diseases and uh, the uh, preventable costs, all the money that's spent. Let me just share just, just one story. Uh, over the weekend, I was at my uh, grandson's first birthday. It's very exciting. Had a chance to connect with uh, family, friends. My uh, son's best friend from high school lives here in uh, Lakewood. Uh, know the family. We've known him for 15 years. And uh, the news is that uh, his father, who lives on Andrews, won't uh, mention his name right now, was just diagnosed with the blockages in uh, five of his coronary arteries, 80% blockage, and uh, scheduled for, uh, well, the uh, plan was to schedule for uh, surgery. Well, now, he didn't talk to me. I heard this from his son. But uh, the uh, fact of the matter is, we have other options besides surgery. Heart disease is the number one killer in the United States still. And the, the Cleveland Clinic does have technology. Uh, we've got low-tech, low-cost technology to treat even severe disease with lifestyle change. Uh, we can treat even severe coronary artery disease with change in uh, diet, exercise, and stress reduction. And those programs are available. And my hope in this vision would be that one of those programs, there are actually two of them. One is the uh, Dean Ornish program for uh, reversing heart disease, and the other is uh, Dr. Esselstyn's program. My hope that we could possibly bring those here to Lakewood. Uh, it's possible that this might be housed in the, uh, uh, the foundation uh, component, uh, a wellness facility, or it possibly could be housed as treatment, because it really is can be both treatment uh, or you could look at this type of thing as uh, prevention. But the fact of the matter is that uh, instead of undergoing a, a very invasive procedure of having your uh, chest literally split apart and uh, taking arteries out of your leg, you didn't need those arteries, did you? But, uh, uh, and s sewing them in there, that uh, uh, we, we could, by uh, sending people to uh, uh, class to teach them about healthy eating, we can actually reverse and unclog those arteries in an outcome that is, uh, in many cases, clinically superior to what would be done 
on the operating room table. So uh, uh, th this is just one example. This same, uh, this same lifestyle change, which hopefully we can promote, of, uh, of healthy eating lifestyle is also a treatment for uh, diabetes, which is a, uh, a disease that is causing uh, an economic uh, and uh, healthcare crisis in the United States. And so, so we have the, the uh, understanding, and all that's needed really is the will and the alignment of all the different organizations. So, so my vision is that we could align our uh, treatment facility, we could align uh, nonprofits that are providing support for the uh, wellness, uh, behavioral health, a very important uh, area in terms of uh, treating addiction and other things, uh, align our public health resources, uh, align things like uh, uh, city policy to promote healthy restaurant options. You know, for example, uh, and I'm gonna give a plug for my friends, the uh, uh, Earth Bistro restaurant, uh, half of their menu items, uh, if you eat them, will reverse your heart disease. Uh, and so I did some calculation, by the way, uh, if you're on uh, a private health insurance, the Cleveland Clinic uh, bypass procedure will go for about $115,000. Uh, my uh, friends uh, at uh, Earth Bistro Restaurant there could uh, provide the uh, food, uh, uh, dinner, and lunch for the next 15 years for that uh, price and, uh, and reverse the heart disease uh, in a healthy way. So thank you very much. Now, now Gary, Gary is a follower of Dr. Esselstein's diet. Uh, I am not. Can you tell the difference actually here? Uh, I should be. Uh, I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Dr. Kathleen McGorry. Kathleen uh, is a retired educator. She has served as principal of McKinley School, uh, Horace Mann School, and uh, Taft, and was a teacher at Lincoln, Franklin, Franklin. <laughs> one more. But uh, anyway, she spent her entire career teaching and uh, leading our, our children and was a, a phenomenal educator. She uh, was a principal of uh, two of my kids at uh, different schools. So very pleased to have Kathleen McGorry speak as well. Thank you. I'm also a Lakewood resident, lifelong Lakewood resident, and I'm proud to have been a Lakewood Hospital trustee for over 15 years. I'm especially proud to have worked with my fellow board members over the past two years to tackle this huge challenge of most appropriate health care um, for Lakewood for the future. And I can tell you, I did not coordinate with Becky, but I can tell you that our board of trustees, our group approached this tough task in a, to a person, proactive, thoughtful, analytical, deliberate, open-minded manner, uh, doing our best to strive to find an answer in the, that's in the best interest of the citizens of Lakewood. We did find it emotional and sad to think about saying goodbye to our 100-year-old hospital, but we've had a chance during this time to become much more interested and excited about what Lakewood uh, stands to gain with the investment in healthcare. I'm particularly comfortable because the parallels with the Lakewood schools seem so clear. Um, with the investment in our schools, we've said goodbye to 100-year-old schools but have replaced them with new state-of-the-art facilities, most importantly with 21st century services inside, just what our children deserve. With the proposed investment in healthcare, we'll say goodbye to our 100-year-old inpatient facility, but we'll have a center for family health that will meet Lakewood's needs today, our inpatient need, outpatient needs, and also be able to adapt to the future. And we'll be able to look ahead and address the future with a wellness foundation. Our neighborhood schools offer our students access to quality education just a short walk away, and the Family Health Center will offer access to quality health care right in the center of town <coughs> and continue emergency services 24-7. As an elementary principal, for many years, I saw that busy Lakewood families need ready access to outpatient services. The statistic that 94% of Lakewood residents who use the hospital do so for outpatient services makes great sense to me. I heard parents talk about the need for um, to see a doctor quickly, to get treatment for their, their children quickly. Um, and I saw the need for prevention services for um, our families. 
um, not so much a need for among our young families for inpatient services. Um, but the family, med family medicine residency program is uh, particularly exciting to me and I think will be, would be to our um, young Lakewood families. Um, Lakewood has been a front runner and a leader in investing in education by transforming our schools. And I think now we have a wonderful opportunity for Lakewood to continue that leadership status by investing in healthcare today. So with a family health center and uh, a continuing emergency room and exciting possibilities for the Wellness Foundation, again, I think we have so much to gain in Lakewood. Given Lakewood's forward thinking history and their investment in education, I look for Lakewood to continue our future orientation, looking ahead to the future with exciting investment in healthcare. I just think that's what we do in Lakewood. Thank you. Our last trustee to speak tonight is Kurt Broski. Kurt, I saw you come in. Uh, Kurt uh, has, a, has an important perspective. He works at the Barton Center and the Westerly. Uh, he understands and thinks all day long about the needs of senior citizens in our community and is going to share his perspective there. Kurt has been a board member of just about every organization I can think of in Lakewood. So <laughs> thanks, Kurt. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, yeah, I've been 18 years on the board and uh, 18 years on the finance committee. Uh, I wanted to tailor my remarks to what I do in my day job, which is uh, I manage uh, six senior citizen low-income apartment communities for uh, about 1,100 folks. Uh, two of those buildings are here in Lakewood, the Westerly and Fedor Manor. And when we have 650 people uh, living in those two facilities. And when our seniors come to us, and we're not a nursing home, we're independent living. When they come to us, they're usually looking for three major things, three concerns they have. One is food, access to a grocery store, a dining hall, or a, a restaurant. Number two is transportation, because two-thirds of our residents do not drive, they don't have a car. And the third thing is access to health care. Something that I've noted over the last 30 years is there's been a migration or an exodus of primary care physicians and specialists from Lakewood to Westlake and other suburbs that are farther away. And so many of the residents who we have who came here because they had the availability for all those three things right here in downtown Lakewood, now they're being cut off, especially that those don't have transportation, they're being cut off from those primary care physicians and those specialists. So at our facility, I mean, we have a car, but the car only drives people within the city limits. Uh, you can go to the office on aging, uh, but many times you have to make an appointment several days in advance. And if you wake up in the morning with a cough and you don't know what to do, uh, what I've seen with our folks is they do one of two things. Some of them will simply call 911. And they use 911 as their primary care physician. And of course, they run to the hospital, they get all these expensive tests, and that's really not efficient uh, uh, or economical for any one of us. The other seniors, uh, many of them are stubborn and don't want to bother anybody. So when they get the cough, they just ignore it. And they ignore it and they ignore it. And now it becomes very serious. Now they really are calling 911. They're going to the hospital and they're being admitted to the hospital with pneumonia. And so something that we've done uh, in our buildings a couple, six years ago, we started a collaboration with Eliza Jennings, where they have an office at Westerly and at Fedor, and they have a registered nurse in that office that's supervised by a nurse practitioner, and that registered nurse has um, office hours, and our residents are free to go down. We don't get involved in any of the money or anything like that, um, and they're free to go down and get some advice, and what we've found over the years is we've actually cut down on the number of EMS calls from our facilities to the hospital. So what my hope out of, out of all of this new family health center, this new organization, is that we can have something like that, not just for seniors, but for everybody that would open up health care 
at this building or somewhere nearby that would make it more accessible to all of us and easier to get to and that's just the way we need to go so that's my comments thank you well we are very very fortunate tonight to have with us three healthcare leaders leaders uh, the three folks uh, to my left have a great deal of hard-earned wisdom and they're here to share that wisdom with us so uh, their goal tonight is to help us to get off to a good start to think about what we need to be thinking about and actions we need to begin to take to get a, a, the foundation built properly for the creation of a new foundation to serve our community and its benefits that they will provide. So let me introduce our team with you. In the center is David Cantor. David Cantor is president of Cantor Consulting Group, a management consulting firm which supports healthcare and human service organizations in addressing their planning, strategy, and mergers and acquisitions issues. Prior to establishing Cantor Consulting, David served as a senior executive for a variety of, for, for, for really more than a decade with two, health, two different healthcare systems. So he's been a practitioner as well. He has appeared as a speaker in a variety of national and regional programs, uh, and particularly addressing healthcare strategy, planning diversification, and management issues. He received his MBA from the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania and was a member of the leadership class of 1994. So we're, David will serve as our facilitator tonight, but he also brings his own share of expertise. On my far left is Deborah Vesey. Deborah is president and chief executive officer of the Deaconess Foundation. She has been with the foundation since its inception in 1997, and she assumed the chief operating officer role in 2002. She's a graduate of Leadership Cleveland class of 2006, and actually there's a whole host of experiences in uh, leadership uh, organizations that she's been involved with, and I'll just touch on a couple of them. Uh, she's actually been involved with the Fund for Our Economic Future, which was uh, an unprecedented collaboration among philanthropic sectors across Northeast Ohio to promote regional economic development. So she not only brings perspectives from the Deaconess Foundation, but as well as from a variety of other foundations that she's worked with. Uh, she was recognized as Woman of Note by Cranes Cleveland Business in September 2001 and has had a, a variety of awards throughout her illustrious career and we're very grateful that she's joining us tonight to share her experiences. So thank you, David and, and Deborah. Uh, I'm, our last uh, uh, panelist is uh, Denise San Antonio Zeman. Uh, Denise has enjoyed a long and successful career, career in philanthropy, healthcare, nonprofit administration, human services, and higher education. Career highlights include building a new community-based private foundation from the ground level up, executing two successful hospital turnarounds, and serving on the executive team that merged the clinical and administrative functions of four competing nonprofit organizations into an integrated care delivery system. I'm sure that was no small task. Uh, Denise has led the St. Luke's Foundation of Cleveland for 15 years. With assets of over a 185 million, in an annual grant-making budget of 13 million, St. Luke's is the largest healthcare foundation in the region. And during her tenure as CEO of the foundation assets, staffing, and operating budget have tripled, and the strategic priorities were established with measurable deliver deliverables. She's a lifelong resident of Northeast Ohio and also has a, a, accumulated an enormous amount of other leadership experiences and awards. So I think you get the idea that these folks have been in the trenches, they were there at the beginning, similar to a room like this, probably long ago, trying to figure out now what do we do? And that's just where we are. So David, I'm gonna turn it over to you and we're grateful that these folks are with us. So please give a Lakewood welcome to our guests tonight. Thank you, Mayor. Wow, that got mild real fast, didn't it? Okay, well, so I'm not gonna speak very much right now. These are the two experts you really came here to hear this evening. Uh, just wanna emphasize that there's a lot of good experience you're gonna hear about from both Denise and Deb right now, and I'd really urge you to keep your ears wide open. So you heard from some of your hospitals, uh, hospital uh, uh, association trustees about some of the thoughts they went through in thinking about how the hospital has to evolve. So that's one conversation. The conversation tonight is one to think about, well, what would you do if you actually had a bank of resources to use in establishing a foundation for the betterment of the health of the community? And the things that Denise and Deb will share with you are gonna be really substantial and, and important things for you to think about as you start thinking about what do you wanna see happen in Lakewood? Not to cookie cutter it, 
but to think about, oh, what are the, the lessons to be learned you can take from the experiences of St. Luke's and Deaconess for the benefit of the city of Lakewood. Uh, Denise and Deborah are going to speak 20, 25 minutes, and then we're going to do some small group conversation and open it up for some questions after that. So we'll start with Denise. Denise Zeman, please. Thank you, David. You're welcome. It's really great to be here tonight, and um, I think I'll, I'll, I'll open my remarks by saying, uh, by sharing with you um, a statement that we in health philanthropy uh, make over and over again. Um, we always like to say that if you've met one health foundation, you've met one health foundation. And I think that sort of capsulizes, you know, the importance of these opportunities for community engagement. And I encourage everybody here and tell your friends, you need to get involved in the process of identifying the priorities for your community, for your community foundation. Um, a health foundation is a unique opportunity, I think. Um, and you know, when I, when I, I went into health philanthropy 15 years ago, um, after about 20 years as a, uh, in, as a healthcare executive, and um, I went into it uh, thinking that it was, gee, this is great. You know, you have this money and you get to give it away and you get to decide how it goes. But very quickly, I learned that um, the responsibility of a health foundation is enormous because it's the health of the residents that's in question. It's the health of the residents that's, that's, that's the focus. And so um, I, I commend your, your mayor and your, and your trustees of the, of the hospital for their thoughtful deliberation and their engagement of you and in, in, in these decisions. And I, and I encourage you, as I said, to get involved uh, early and often. Uh, when St. Luke's Hospital actually uh, was established, it was in 97. And it was not at the time that the hospital closed. It was at the time that the hospital was sold. And the, the, at that time, that, this is a completely different situation uh, than, than is yours, as is, I think, every, uh, every conversion, is what they call these, these hospitals, you know, the conversion foundations. But the responsibility of the board um, became how to, you know, uh, figure out what to do with these assets. And they were the assets that were remaining in the hospital after it was sold. It was about three years later that the new owner of the hospital that had come in with great promises um, decided to close the hospital. Um, and so those two actions at, in that instance were not connected to one another. The assets though, the, the, the assets were managed by the board of the, the first hospital. And at that time, they thought that the hospital trustees should become the foundation trustees. And they learned pretty quickly that the issues where we were you know, trying to make an impact were different from the issues that affected the hospital. And so they were wise in their decision to expand their governance. And they began to identify people with expertise in the areas where they were trying to have an impact on health. They, they established a mission 15 years ago, 18 years ago now, to improve and transform health and well-being. And that mission has served them well since the beginning. The strategies have changed. As we learned about kind of, you know, what, pro, what that meant, you know, health and well-being, what does that mean? Um, we, we realized that um, that could mean so many things that it would be, you know, easy to just kind of spread the, the money all around. And so the, the board went through a very intentional process of figuring out what they meant by improve and transform health and well-being. And they opted to look at that in two ways. And so our, our grant making at St. Luke's fell into kind of two buckets. The health improvement bucket was the bucket of, of the, the, the funds that we used to support programs. Um, you know, you're not in this business, it's like being a mom. You know, you're not supposed to have favorites. Um, I'm a stepmom, so you're allowed to have favorites. And I do, and I won't tell you which one it is. But uh, I am now the retired um, CEO of St. Luke's, and I can tell you one of my favorite grantees is sitting in this room right now, North Coast Health. We saw what happened at North Coast Health as an opportunity to improve. It was direct care where it was needed, it was high quality, it still is, Lee's awesome, and you are lucky to have an asset like that in your community. So that was part of our improvement strategy, and we made about maybe a third of our grants 
to improve health by providing care. However, the transform part was different. We wanted to address health before care. And why is that important? I think it's important for all the reasons that were quoted out here. It's the prevention stuff. It's the most important part of having a healthy lifestyle, having a healthy community. And unfortunately, it's the part that nobody pays for. So the fact that your community is going to get 30 million or 31 million dollars, my myth is not great, um, but uh, to, to, to focus on transforming the health, not necessarily the care, but the health of your community is awesome. It's an awesome opportunity. And it's an, it's an opportunity that, that we embraced at St. Luke's. We recognized we couldn't do everything. And so for St. Luke's, what was important in our community, probably different from what's important in your community, but we focused on three things. We focus on healthy people. We focus on strong communities. And because people generally live in some semblance of a family, we focus on resilient families. Those are our three priorities at St. Luke's. And what we try to do is make a measurable impact on those three things for the community that we serve. In, in, Saint, in the case of St. Luke's, we decided to take uh, an interest in the neighborhoods that were historically surrounded by the hospital, because first of all, that's where most of our hourly employees live. <coughs> and secondly, it's where most of our patients came from. And so, to this day, we remain deeply committed, and in fact, last year, we moved our offices back into the hospital because it was repurposed into a, a facility that houses um, actually affordable senior housing and nonprofits uh, offices and, and some services. But the, the healthy communities part is the one where we did a lot of due diligence, and that's where I believe there's a lot of opportunity. Um, you know, it would be so cool to, to, to think about Lakewood as the healthiest community in the county, in the state, in the country, in the world. We've got the chief nurse of the world here. I mean, let's, <laughs> let's face it, you've got some assets here. Um, and, and so, but, but health, you know, health happens in the community. And if the community doesn't have healthy places to eat, which was mentioned by one of your trustees, or by healthy food. Um, you know, that's, a, that's an issue. That's, a, that's an issue of both availability and policy. And with an, a, an asset like this foundation will have, you'll have an opportunity to you know, spend some of that money in very creative ways. Um, you can affect policy. You can, you can you know, go to the uh, mayor and, and city council and say, look, you know, we want legislation that makes Lakewood a healthy community. We, we're doing some pilot projects, we're funding some pilot projects in, uh, at St. Luke's with using um, health impact assessments. And what that is, is a set of, of tools that a community can use to assess the health impact of a pending um, development project. Uh, maybe it's a community development, maybe it's a, maybe it's a, a construction project. Maybe, you know, so, so it's, a, it's a set of tools that allows you to impact the health of the community. And what we're trying to do with that is demonstrate that when you study the potential impact of decisions on the health of the community, you can make modifications that, you know, uh, perhaps, you know, adds sidewalks or adds bike lanes or adds, you know, whatever it is that might be needed to promote health. And I think you, you get what I mean. Um, so there are policy implications. Um, you know, health is about where you live, where you go to school, which sounds like you've really got that piece of it, you know, taken care of. Not all communities are as fortunate to have, you know, healthy, healthy school buildings even. <coughs> but, um, you know, the, when we look at health outcomes and we look at the things that impact positive health outcomes, the number one correlate is educational attainment. People who attain a higher level of education tend to have a longer life and a healthier life. So, you know, by focusing on those things and focusing on the things that create the opportunity to live a healthy lifestyle will get you much further along the line of becoming a healthy community. And so we're focusing on a lot of that in, in, um, in, in, in the, the, the neighborhoods around St. Luke's. 
Um, we are also working in collaboration with the County Health Department. Um, they have a project called uh, Place Matters, and I know I'm, I'm, I'm talking a lot here, but, but this, this is a, a project that promotes healthy eating and active living countywide. And, and, and so I'm, I'm, I'm using these examples uh, as you know, just sort of food for thought Part of your uh, meeting is, it is going to be um, you know, a, a dialogue around what's most important in Lakewood. But um, I encourage you to keep an open mind. Um, I, one of the, you know, I, I did uh, orchestrate a, a, you know, a couple of successful hospital tur turnarounds, one of which ultimately then related in a hospital closure. And so I know what that's like. And it's hard, and it's change, and it's loss. But I think you know, if you look at the opportunities in front of you um, that you really, um, the, the, the glass can be half full in Lakewood. Um, and I think you have a tremendous opportunity ahead of you. Thank you, Denise. Deb, your observations. Uh, thank you so much for having me here this evening, and I'm going to share components of Deaconess's journey with you and hope that some of that will resonate, hope that some of that will give you some food for thought. Um, I defer to my colleague Denise as the expert in healthcare because interestingly enough, Deaconess didn't take that path. Uh, Deaconess Hospital was sold back in December of 1994, and they made a decision at that point in time to take two years and to guide themselves through a very, very intensive, what we called strategic planning process. Um, and the purpose of that process was, was, um, was more than twofold, but primarily it was because of the fact that there were a lot of different constituencies that had invested time, money, emotion, everything into Deaconess Hospital. Uh, Deaconess, it was and still is very much rooted in the community of the United Church of Christ. So we were very concerned about our United Church of Christ members and those members of those churches that had volunteered at the hospital. Um, of course, the employees, the residents, um, and individuals in the community, community leaders, the trustees, the elected officials. And everyone cared deeply about this asset. They all, they all understood appreciated, weren't real happy about the fact that this asset was going away, that it was being sold. Um, at the time, Deaconess was sold to another for-profit healthcare provider called Primary Health Systems. I don't know if many of you remember that, but they first bought Deaconess, then they bought Mount Sinai, then I think it was St. Alexis, and unfortunately, they went bankrupt. Um, but there was still a very difficult process that the community was going through in really grieving the loss of this asset. Uh, but what the, the intention of the process was is to allow people to not really grieve so much as to focus their energies and efforts and be part of creating something exciting and new for their community. I have learned in my career in philanthropy very strongly that people support what they help create. And it was important to us that we had a process that helped the people that cared, which I know it's all of you sitting in this room today, to help be part of creating the next chapter. And so, as I said, we hired a consultant and we went through a very extensive process. Most of it um, consisted of meetings like these and inviting people that were interested to come and talk. Um, we were focused on making some important decisions. Those decisions were things like determining our mission. You know, what is the focus and purpose of this foundation going to be? Um, we talked about our vision for this foundation. We all agreed on our values. You know, what were our core values that were going to drive all of our decisions? We talked about the geographic area. Um, all, those, all those areas that are really important to make decisions on. For Deaconess, it was quite interesting because this was a hospital that had operated for 80 years in the old Brooklyn community in the city of Cleveland. Um, the individuals that participated in the process felt very strongly that the Deaconess had been in the healthcare business for 80 years. But through these conversations, what, what the majority decided um, and felt very strongly about was that this community built this asset, this community grew this asset, and they wanted to see the proceeds from that go back to the community. 
So they started talking a lot about you know, what type of philanthropy and what else did, had the hospital done as a community partner in its 80 <coughs> years in the old Brooklyn neighborhood. And they started to see a theme, and the theme was really about empowerment, um, empowerment of individuals. And yes, you can talk about healthcare being empowering, education being empowering, but where we landed is we decided that the mission of the foundation was to provide resources to nonprofit organizations that help individuals become empowered to become self-sufficient. And that was the driving mission of Deaconess Hospital, of Deaconess Foundation for its first 17 years of existence. And we've got individuals in this room today, uh, Trish Rooney from Lakewood Community Services Center um, that we have a long-standing relationship with and have supported many of her programs because their focus is on empowering people to become self-sufficient. They meet them where they are in their journey in life and then provide programs that hopefully we can support um, to help those people move through, um, through their journey, through barriers, remove barriers, to ultimately become self-sufficient as they define it for themselves. So again, that process was very important, and I commend the mayor and the trustees and others for having these community meetings. I encourage them to be continued because these are very, very important decisions. I'll talk a little bit about the geography. Um, as Denise said, many healthcare foundations were, were sort of staying within the neighborhood that the hospital had served. Deaconess talked about that as well. And interestingly enough, they said, as much as we care deeply about this neighborhood, and they still owned um, senior housing facilities that surrounded the hospital campus, they said the reality is that many of the individuals that supported this organization and that were patients of this hospital came from outside of Old Brooklyn. They came from West Side neighborhoods and other areas. So the initial determination was, let's go ahead and say that we're gonna fund organizations in Northeast Ohio. When we started to do grant making, we realized quickly that was a little too big. So, <laughs> because we were getting requests from everyone and anyone who defined themselves within Northeast Ohio. So um, a few years in, we decided to make it more specific and uh, d decided on Cuyahoga County. And we have since stuck with that geographic focus. So again, there's no right way to do this, but I guess what I would say is, please allow yourselves to take the time to really give this some thoughtful deliberation, to really work together, um, to talk through your ideas. Um, and the other thing that I wanna say, because I can remember as I was part of this process 20 years ago, it felt very overwhelming to me. I, it was daunting. I felt this huge sense of responsibility of making this decision for tens of millions of dollars. But what I came to realize now in retrospect is that you're going to do the best job you can do right now. And nothing that you do is ultimately cast in stone. So don't feel like you all have to be in 100% agreement on where to go. Because what's going to happen is your community is going to continue to change, the world's going to continue to change, and hopefully you will be nimble enough to change with it. Deaconess Foundation, like I said, for its first 17 years, focused on self-sufficiency. Within the last three years, we went through our first strategic planning process to really look back and look at what impact we had been having to question whether we could be doing it better and what we learned from our grantees, what we learned about the community, and what had happened here locally in the last 17 years, told us that we really needed to get a little more focused. And through a process, again, bringing in a consultant, um, we narrowed our focus from self-sufficiency to helping individuals prepare for, get, and keep jobs. Because what we saw that was a common thread in all the organizations that we were funding, whether you were coming out of prison, whether you were coming out of a homeless shelter, whether you were escaping domestic violence, whether you were you know, um, coming out of a drug rehab facility, what we were hearing from those providers was that ultimately the key to their independence and ability to escape that life was the ability to get help and get to the point where they could get and keep a job. 
where they could be independent, where they could provide for their family. So we just started in January of last year under that new mission, and it's really quite exciting. I sort of feel like I'm running a brand new foundation again, even though it's the same foundation, because we now have a responsibility to learn deeply about this area of employment, to talk to those individuals in the community about what's working and what's not working, to understand where there are gaps in service, and, and how can we help? How can we best do this? As in healthcare, in employment, or whatever other specific area, there's always room for more people to be at the table. And I can tell you that our community needs you. We need another foundation that's committed to helping those that are disadvantaged. So one, I congratulate you for being here tonight. I am excited for all of you because as, as much as I know many of you are still reeling from this change in decision, I want you to know that the future is bright and you have an opportunity to be a part of shaping that future. And if there's anything that I can do in the future to help you do that, I'm more than happy to. But, you know, I just think that this is a very exciting, very exciting time. And I'm just going to add one more thing. Denise talked about governance. And I have to commend and thank the trustees of the hospital um, and even the hospital foundation. I know how difficult this has been. And I worked with the old hospital <coughs> board of trustees of Deaconess. Um, and making the decision was very difficult. But these are individuals that were committed to health care. And they are going to be there to help shift this asset into a new direction. But they are going to need to have other individuals in the community that have the expertise, that have the passion, that bring a different skill set to help move this new asset forward. So again, I think that you should be very, very appreciative of the work that they've done, and maybe some of them will consider to stay on. But that board and that governance is going to need to look different as time goes on in order to do that job well. So I'm going to stop so we have time for <coughs> Q&A and questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Deb. So you know, if I had let them, they would have talked till 10 o'clock. And that would have kind of passed our 9 o'clock deadline here tonight. And obviously, we want to have, give you folks time to do some thinking uh, and talking amongst yourselves as to what things you're wondering about. What seems like good news? What seems like not so good news? What's the biggest question you have? What have you? And so to give you all the chance to have some time to process some of what you've heard tonight, we're going to do something a little bit different this evening. So, you're in three different sections here on purpose. And there are row numbers on the side of every other row here on purpose. There is a method to madness this evening. Unfortunately, if you look at your yellow sheet of paper, which has the agenda on it, it says we're on item number six right now. And it says table discussions. <laughs> but there are no tables. So. In one more element of change and flexibility, which as you've heard the theme of your speakers this evening, is one of the things you better get used to. That's what the healthcare industry has been about. I've been in healthcare for over 30 years, and it's been one of constant change, constant challenge, what have you. Tonight, you'll have a chance to basically follow that lead a little bit. You're gonna make believe there's a table between each of your two rows here. So, here's what your charge is now. Your charge is to put yourself at this, I'll help you organize this, I promise. Your charge is to put yourself into small groups and to answer three questions in your small group. Question number one, and the questions are actually here. It's at, all three things are here right now. Question number one is, what is the biggest question you've got about the whole idea of setting up this wellness foundation thingy? What's your biggest question? One question. It's gonna be hard. But you're only going to have 15 minutes for this. You better have one question. I'm going to go group to group and ask you for your question. But your experts here can answer for you. If you have more than one, the hook goes on. That's question number one. Number two, what's the thing that's most appealing to you about all this? What's the thing that gets you most jazzed about what you might be heading out into the world to do? And number three, what's your biggest concern? Now, somebody with neat handwriting has to be your scribe. And one of you who, who has neat handwriting will write this on, what are we writing these things on? 
We have note cards here. Da da. Okay. What you're going to do is write them down there, and then at the end of the evening, you're going to end up plopping that card into our basket here, so that we'll have the the we'll have the uh, concerns as well as the things you're most jazzed about. What we will do is we'll have each group share with us their biggest question, and we will have our experts here answer that. Now, how are you going to organize yourselves? Well. The odd rows, those of you who have this little thing on the side of your things here, you're going to turn around and you're going to be facing your neighbors and that's going to be kind of like your quasi table in between you and you're going to spend the time talking about this. I know you're all very enthused, I can see you're all thrilled about this. This is what you're going to do though. Because in the end, if you actually spend a few minutes talking about this, out will pop a whole bunch of questions that many of you are wondering about right now. On this, I'm going to ask you to trust me. I've done this a zillion times before. Most of your questions will get asked just this way. Uh, it's now a little bit before 8 o'clock. Take till around 8.10 or so. This means you have to turn your chairs around pretty fast and get talking. And around 8.10, I'm going to blow the whistle, and we're actually going to start saying, give me your question. Go to work. I can't hear you. Huh? Can you hear Okay, time to stop. Time to stop. No. Time to stop talking now. Now. Time to stop talking now. Stay with your group. Don't run away. Don't hide from your from your colleagues. It's illegal. Stay with the people you're with. Uh, so some of you clearly had a problem when you were kids. Do I have to start embarrassing you, really? It's time to stop talking, really, really, now, now. Biz, time is up. Stay with your groups, it's okay, stay where you are. It's all right, I'm gonna come to you. So, I'm gonna wander around the room and you're going to share with me your group's biggest question. I'm also going to have a basket here. And you're gonna plop it to the basket, your list, uh, your card with the, your biggest question, your biggest thrill and your biggest concern. By the way, don't lose your green pieces of paper. You're gonna need those for the night is over to give us some thought processes from you, for, for each of you individually. So we're gonna start with the group over here. You know, you know why we're doing this? Because you weenies who sat in the back of the room, because you don't want to be, be near the teacher, you get punished, you go later. People in front get to go first. And just, just do your question, and you can do the microphone. There you go. Just stand up. Our question is, how are we going to support the underinsured in our community? You guys want to take a crack at that one? You could. Well, I think there's, uh, you know, there, there is uh, not enough money in any foundation anywhere uh, to fully support the underserved. So I think what is what the community needs to do is identify the highest um, need and figure out the best provider for those needs and support that organization, those organizations. I think, you know, Lakewood has several uh, really wonderful um, programs, uh, and so you know, providing support to those would be uh, would be important. Uh, but I think uh, the other thing is, you know, in in, in a community where um, there are underserved, um, you know, going upstream to create the environment for a healthy community goes further than providing the direct care and advocate for um, better legislation. Deb, quick just, just really quickly, I wanted to say that um, please remember when you're tackling some of these tough questions and that, please remember to always stop and understand and reach out and know who else in your community cares deeply about that same issue. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes we, we approach things as if we're the only ones that are worried about this, we're the only ones that think about this. Your community and your surrounding communities have a lot of rich assets, so take the time to really map that out, talk to those individuals and understand that, because there might be a real strong opportunity for a good partnership or collaboration. Group over here. This group spent some time talking about the structure. Stand up. 
this group spent some time talking about the structure of this new board. How would it be structured? Is it designed to have experts on it or to be representative of Lakewood's various constituencies or both? Would it be a good idea to have an initial board designed to be transitional towards the goal of forming the mission, the vision, and the permanent board structure? That was an outstanding example of new math, right? There was one question, right? <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> There's two more questions. Why is there air? <laughs> everything in here. Oh, yeah, we want everything. I want everything. Thank you. Yeah. So, you want, so why don't you guys take a crack at thinking about sports structures just for a minute, okay? Deb, let's take a crack at this. Well, you know, the structure is a, is, is a critical, critical issue. And I think that, you know, you, you have um, individuals that have committed as volunteers to support the existing asset, the Hospital Foundation, and others that are interested. Um, I think as this process is going on, I hope that they will reach out and bring other people into this sort of process of thinking about creating a mission, a vision, and values. Um, but yes, I think that there has to be an openness to considering, to allowing some new voices and new perspectives to come on the board. Um, but it's not as if it has to be a wholesale change. I think that that happens gradually over time. I think that you have to give credit to the trustees that they're willing to change and grow with this new organization as well. And you're gonna have some people self-select off that say, you know, I really only cared about the hospital. I like what you're thinking about doing. I see value in it, but quite frankly, it's not my passion. So they'll select off and make room for someone else. But yes, I think it's very, very important to start with the core group you have, but really make a commitment to and an understanding of what type of individuals do you want. And hopefully through this process and through these discussions, um, some, some of those people will, will appear and make sure it's not always the usual suspects. Really think outside the box. Make an effort for diversity of right. all kinds. Right. Diversity of thought, age, gender, race, all the first diversity particularly those you seek to serve. Right. Uh, there's a, there's, there was a wonderful article done by grant makers for effective organizations called Do Nothing About Me Without Me. Don't forget that. Yeah. Thank you. Who's the spokesperson over here? In a foundation that's a mixture of public and private assets, how can the citizens of Lakewood be assured of transparency and accountability when it hasn't been forthcoming yet. So the good thing about a foundation is that the, the foundation is really um, uh, governed by IRS guidelines. There are very stringent guidelines depending upon what kind of foundation is formed. There's really three different classifications within the IRS code. Now, I'm not gonna give you a lecture on that tonight, but, depend, but, but they're all governed by the IRS code and they all involve an, a, 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 an element of transparency. And so um, that's, you know, that's something that you can, um, can demand, really. Uh, they, you know, they have to file their tax returns. They, they, they have to you know, uh, publish. There's public information that's available uh, for, um, even for private foundations. And I would just add that, you know, board composition is important. When Deaconess went through this, again, we had the, um, our roots in and a strong commitment to the United Church of Christ. So we still to this day um, have in our uh, bylaws uh, very specific statements about our composition. And it states that there must be a minimum number. It used to be eight, now it's five members of United Church of Christ churches. So if there are certain representations or voices that you wanna make sure are part of this, you can incorporate that into your bylaws, but that can, again, change over time as the needs of the organization change as well. How you doing? Doing well. Doing well, yeah. How's the evening going so far? Okay. Yeah. Interesting conversation so far? Folks, over here. Yeah, I want to talk to you. Yeah, well, I'll talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 it's today, 20th day. Time, time going okay so far? You're doing okay. You're doing okay? Yeah. Okay. So who, who's your spokesperson over here? Yeah. Oh, you are. Okay, what's the question? Our question is uh, similar to a previous, uh, previous one. And that Ask is, it anyway. I will. Which comes first? It's kind of a chicken and an egg thing. Which comes first, establishing governance or determining the mission? 
So when we have 50,000 people in the community, do you try and you know, filter through and come up with a mission first and then find the trustees to serve that mission, or do you find a bunch of community people, put them together, and let them help to create that mission? Who wants to take that one first? Well, you have to have a certain number of directors in order to incorporate as a foundation in order to seek your um, nonprofit 501c3 status as a foundation, depending on what kind of foundation you establish. So you need a certain, I think three, it's not a lot, but a minimum of three to um, actually start the organization. So I say you start with some number of trustees and, you know, take it from there. And, you know, it is a chicken or egg thing, but quite frankly, it's difficult to ask people to serve as a trustee if they don't know what you're asking them to serve for. Yes. So having the mission in place, it's really the mission that people either, you know, embrace and have a passion for or not. So I, I really think that, you know, there's a core group of people that still have the, if you will, governance responsibility that's transitioning, and you should be open to that but definitely make mission uh, a priority. Group over here, first middle group, who's the spokesperson here? Let's try. Okay, go for it. Uh, the question is- Stand up, sir, let me see your smiling face. There you go, Thank smiling you. too, there you go. If we have great parks, a great Y, great schools that teach health and promote exercise, a great senior center with senior services, is this new wellness foundation needed? No, there's no candy in here. No. <laughs> Denise? I think that's a question you need to a ask yourselves, uh, to answer for <clears throat> yourselves. I think that's a great question because it's not, you know, if, if, if all of those things are available and equally accessible to all of your citizens, then, you know, maybe the answer is no. And you can give the money back. I don't know what else you would do with it, but, um, but, uh, uh, I think if you look at um, the health status of all of your citizens, you might find that there's some disparity. And, and then again, you might not. I don't know. I don't know Lakewood as well. But um, if there are disparities, then perhaps some of the assets could go toward bridging some of those disparities. Why don't we cut to the chase? Who here thinks we need this thing? So thank you for... So you know... So Who would rather have a hospital? Thank you. Okay. So, you know, I'll just make an observation about the question about do you need a foundation or not. There is not a community in the United States that doesn't have a huge number of significant social and health needs. You can't find one. And that includes Lakewood. In part of my practice, I do a lot of work with various communities and various agencies in the communities. And so you could say you have all these wonderful assets. There are certainly going to be needs there. Whether or not you need a new foundation set up to address those needs is another story. Could you find good uses for those funds to be used to help address a number of different issues you have in the community? Certainly, that would be a no-brainer, yes. There's not a consultant around who wouldn't tell you that. That's, that's, that's a given. The issue about structure is another story completely. Question over here. Who, who's up next? You are. So we had conflicted stuff. Uh, uh, Stand up, sir. Let me see your face. So we had conflicted views. One question was, do we, uh, uh, can we have both? Can we have uh, the health stuff and also keep the hospital open? Another question is, the change of health care is changing in the future, and do we need the hospital? And the other issue is, can we uh, possibly live without the hospital? And several people said no. Okay, so I'll take your questions there. You can't read them. I can't read them. Okay, I can't read them. So I would like one of the uh, hospital uh, association trustees to take a crack at some of those comments that are raised here. Who wants to kind of take a little crack? I don't want to spend a lot of time as related to the hospital. It's not our problem tonight, honestly. But I, I do want to have one person take one comment on this. Who wants to do this? Okay, you're volunteered. Go well, for it. Again, do we need a hospital? We have hospitals all around us that are very short distance. No, we have diversion programs, and they get closed, so we don't have access to them. No, but we have Fairview Hospital. Whoa, 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 whoa. But we have, we have Fairview Hospital. That was closed 38 days last year. One, one comment, please. Question, let's have an answer, please. 
So we have Fairview Hospital that is extremely close to us. And the reality of it is, is that we know many of our citizens go there anyway. When you look at the statistics for who's using our hospital for inpatient, you know, many of those are individuals outside of our, our county. They're f coming in from Avon. Our community uses our hospital predominantly for outpatient services. So let's create a great outpatient service environment uh, and, and not have very expensive inpatient hospital beds. I mean, the building requires upkeep, maintenance. You know, where do you get the money to do that? So I'm very comfortable knowing how close Fairview is to us. Let's see, next group in the middle here. Who's up next? You guys are here up next. Who's up? Thank you. Getting back to um, the foundation, um, just kind of mirroring a little bit of what Kurt's group stated um, relative to um, governance and mission, our question is more, you know, taking a step backwards and where do you start? What is actually step one? Who makes the decision on the governance and mission and how are they chosen? Thank you. So, I mean, if I were to start a foundation today, uh, I would probably do a health needs assessment, a comprehensive study of the, of the health status of the citizens of Lakewood. I would use data to inform my set of priorities. Um, so that's, that's what I, and, and, and to de, you know, kind of define, um, you know, to, to, to kind of start from a, 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 a position of, of knowledge of data. And I, I would, um, I would strongly recommend that consideration be given to um, committing yourself to uh, a process, a process that is inclusive, that's transparent, um, and to spend the time and the resources, quite frankly, to bring in a professional who does this type of planning, who has been through this before, who has provided this kind of guidance. That person's job is not to decide for you. It is to help you through a process in a logical way to understand what are the questions we need to ask, you know, what is the logical order in which to do these, to help facilitate conversation, to, and to sort of really help all the pieces come together. And part of that would be a community needs a, a community assessment. Um, I'm sure there are many of you in this room that have completely different perspectives of what this community does and doesn't need and what people do and don't need. If there's one thing that I've learned in philanthropy is that there was an entire world out there that was invisible to me before philanthropy. There were people out there that I hate to say were invisible to me before philanthropy. Um, and until you work in that area and you understand that there are citizens of Lakewood and your surrounding communities that you know do not have appropriate education and can't access the park to enjoy it and all the things that you and your family do, you'll really realize how important it is for you to really have this foundation to do good works, but really invest the time and energy and resources in helping a professional guide you through the process and helping the leadership that's in place now, you know, engage you in that process as you go through. Because um, when we started to go through this, it was one of those, we really didn't know what we didn't know. Mm -hmm. um, we wanted to do a good job. You know, we wanted to make right choices. Um, but having someone help us through that, I would say, was just invaluable. So that would be my advice. Group over here. Who's the? You're welcome. Um, our question sort of came around the um, letter of intent. And it is, how do we ensure that the new foundation will be established as an independent entity that addresses the well-being of the community rather than that of the medical system? Denise? We, we don't really know what's in the letter of intent. Yeah. So it would be hard for us to answer that, for us to answer that question. Yeah. So we want to take a crack at that over there. Anybody want to talk about this? The fact is, um, there's going to be, uh, this proposal becomes um, our strategy. Uh, there will be payments 
somewhere to a foundation and it will be for the benefit of the community to be managed by the community. It's really up to us as a, as a community to determine and make sure that we're independent. We have that obligation here. It's going to take some leadership to step up and, 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 uh, and make sure we, we do a good job for our community. All of us. Question over here. May I just add, as, as a, a trustee, I don't think anyone, I'll speak for my other trustees, I don't think any of us uh, have any predetermined interest in being part of the new foundation unless the community would like us as interim stewards to take the process from where it is to where the community wants it to be. I've heard various comments about transparency or what's in it for the trustees and all this money that's coming. We have no interest in that money other than what it can do for the, the community and for uh, the residents of Lakewood. Um, we are organized as a body, so we have policies and procedures that could start the process. But I think all of us would be happy to step back and let whomever would like to run that foundation run it. Actually, there's also a point that the IRS guidelines governing foundations are different from the IRS guidelines governing nonprofit uh, organizations. And when, just as an example, just as an example, when St. Luke's Hospital was in existence as a nonprofit hospital, uh, the, the IRS guidelines allowed certain um, business dealings with people on the board. Uh, the IRS guidelines governing foundations pr preclude that. And so there was one individual who was providing some services to the hospital, and we had to say, look, you know, we love you as a provider, we love you as a board member, but now that we're a foundation, you can't be both. And so, you know, the IRS does have very stringent guidelines for foundations. Much so, more stringent than for nonprofits. So we're back over here. Who's the next group over here? Thank you. You're welcome. Um, our question also was about <coughs> mission initially, but it kind of, uh, as we started talking, evolved to um, how do we engage this community in determining that mission? So w could you talk a little bit about what steps you took to really engage that community That's into giving their input and determining what direction your foundation was going to head? And one of, one of the people in our group thought even just this little thing like this, simple thing that could be mailed out to all citizens to really give their input and share you know, what direction they, w they would want to take. Thank you. That's a great question. That is a great question. And I think, you know, the, 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 that suggestion is a great one. I think, you know, the, the ability, what, what we did uh, when we did our strategic planning process, um, we convened small focus groups, we had surveys and so forth, uh, especially around the, the um, issues that were important. We also talked at, at the, for the last process, since we had a body of grantees that we had been supporting, we convened some of them to help us think through our process about you know, ways that we could be most helpful to them. But I think establishing early on opportunities for dialogue, real engagement. Now, today, with electronic media, uh, there's, there's even you know, better opportunities to, to truly keep a community engaged. Deb, any thoughts? I, I think I'm going to probably repeat myself here, but um, I'm going back to you know, commit to a process and commit to hiring someone to help you design what process works best for you. Um, but the process itself is really about making sure that it's designed so that all the various voices can be heard. And various voices need to be heard in different ways, in different forums, in different manners. So um, that's why the, this is an exciting time, but it's more difficult because there's no one size fits all for this. And so when we thought about the process that we did at Deaconess, you know, we had a different type of process to engage our UCC church members versus the volunteers, versus the staff people at the hospital, versus community members, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, because some wanted to be very engaged and have multiple levels of discussion. Some didn't need or want that. And so it's really making sure that we understand 
what it is that you want and then collectively designing a process and having someone help sort of facilitate and guide that process with you. Over here in the middle, who's up next? You've already addressed uh, our biggest question and our biggest question was about governance. Uh, who and how are selections made for members? And I think it's already been asked three times. That's a big question. Okay. Uh, who's next over here? Oh, careful. Our um, question has, part of it has been answered too. The one that hasn't is, how is the amount of money determined? Well, we don't know that. Yeah, I, no. the mayor talked about that earlier, so. I think it's a practical element. I think about what, what's a reasonable yield on a foundation investment? 3%, 5% a year? Oh, so, um, it's better than that, usually. Well, we, yeah, eight. depends on the market. <laughs> depends on the market, yeah. If you take 5% of 32 million, it's about 1.5 million a year. That's, I think, the money we have to invest each year as a practical measure. Could be higher or lower in any given oh, year. I, so I that's, that's I, I, I should have mentioned that in my I opening remarks the in the context of the foundation the doesn't spend its principal, spends its investment yield. Uh, many of you may have been involved, and so I think that's the number I think about. Like, how was the principal determined? That was the question. Oh, uh, 24 million is paid uh, at, in, in really the first year of the proposal. No, the number, where did the number come from? It was negotiated. 10 million, 40. It was, it was, uh, it was negotiated. Uh, and then an additional uh, 500,000 a year for 16 years, 8 million more comes in. So a total of 32 in some capacity. That's kind of an important point here, that we have a board that has an uh, obligation to be transparent by the lease in the, uh, between the city and the LHA. They haven't been transparent. They've decided the amount of money this foundation you're talking about is going to get without any transparency. Are any of the trustees here today willing to be transparent Excuse me. about Sir, the process? Excuse me. Sir, you got to sit down now. Far? Sir, there are a lot of people who haven't had a chance to have their say yet. You've already had a chance to get up once and talk. You can sit down now. Really. This, you is, can't. this is America, I thought. Yes, it is America. <laughs> and that's great. A lot of the people haven't had a chance to have their say yet. Thank you. We're going to find out where we're going. We should be where we are. If you want to talk about trust. Who's up next in the back over here? You're not going to be transparent under the contract. Who's the, who's the question now? over here? We're going to be transparent in the future. We've, uh, We've had similar questions to other groups, and the primary one was, how do you develop programming that reaches effectively to all corners of the community? Denise, that I, didn't hear, I that. didn't hear that question. I'm sorry. For a community as um, diverse as Lakewood, how would the foundation go about identifying and then reaching all corners of the community with effective programming? That's a great question. You know, you 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 will not be able to meet all health needs in the community ever with any amount of money. Um, and so I think what you need to do is through this process, and Deb is right on in this, uh, through this process of identifying the mission, identifying you know, what health, a healthy Lakewood means to you, means to the, to the, to the people of this community, then um, you, that's kind of your, that's your end point. And then you go about the process of it's, it's due diligence, it's, it's research, it's finding out who's doing what, who's, who's doing programming that's actually making a difference. Um, and then supporting those organizations that best, that do the best work to advance your mission. And I, I would add that, you know, a mission is what you, what you decide it is. It can be as broad or as specific as you want. Mm -hmm. And so through this initial dialogue, you may all agree on a general topic of wellness. And then through more facilitated dialogue, you may end up saying that we want to <coughs> focus exclusively on youth up to the age of 18 and focus on uh, work in the schools and focus on work in the YWCA and YMCA. I mean, it can be as broad or as narrow as you want. But part of that has to be knowing who else is in this space, who else is doing this work, because this community, our community can't afford duplication. So if there's another foundation in town that's really got a specific healthcare focus, and even though they're not 
geographically located in Lakewood, but they're supporting Lakewood, then let them do that work and you come right. in and do something else right. that isn't being as strongly funded. Right. You know, there's, there are some uh, issues that you'll identify through this process that you didn't even know existed. One of the things we recognized in the Buckeye neighborhood when we looked at it was their rates of lead poisoning children were higher than any catchment area in the, in the county. They were producing lead poison child after lead poison child. We devoted a million dollars over 10 years to a lead poisoning prevention and reduction program and cut that rate in half. Now, it sounds like a long time. It's, it goes like this. It's, it takes, these, these initiatives are not gonna have an impact overnight, you know, but, but that, was an, that was an issue in that community. Um, and so, you know, and then we, we moved on to, to other things. Um, so, you know, you, you, could, you could do anything, really. <coughs> Perhaps your rates of smoking are different. You might wanna get at that. Perhaps your rates of weight are, you know, obesity are different. And so, you know, you, but it depends on your community. Who's up next over here? Um, I think being one of the last groups, everything's pretty much been covered, but... Always a new thought. Always a new thought, yes. So, again, we went back to, in a community of over 50,000 people, how do we determine the mission and direction of this new foundation? What process do you use to decide which areas of wellness to focus on? And then also the idea of, uh, are we under any time constraints? Do we have time? Is there any, you know, should we be worried about collecting input from the community? Um, is there any timeline that we should be worried about? So Deb and Denise, why don't you guys focus on the last part of that question, which hasn't been touched on before in terms of time issues. Um, now, d depending on the type of foundation that's established, uh, there are some minimum distribution requirements, but even your process of determining your vision could count toward, um, you know, that, that distribution. So um, I wouldn't uh, say that there's a, there's a, you know, that there's a, 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 you know, huge concern about taking time. I think Deb was right that, you know, both of our foundations, St. Luke's was established in February of 97, didn't make its first grant until October of 98. It took a long time to, to be very careful and diligent about its process. Yeah. Um, and Deaconess took two years. Um, it took 1996, um, 1995 and 1996, it made its first grants in February of 1997. Next group over here, who's up next? You're welcome. We have two questions. I hope we can get into uh -oh, that. Oh, we'll see if we can. There's one more group back here, right? No, there oh, are the You're the same group? Okay. Wow, what big group. Okay, yeah. go on. You get two questions. Uh, the one question has been addressed in a couple of different ways, but they're asking uh, how can the money that we have now be put to better use? Um, is it being used well now, and how can we look to improvements as it's being used in the future? When you say the money you have now, what are you referring to? The foundation money. Foundation. What, what the programs they're focusing on now, some already have, have disappeared or there's rumors that they will be gone. And how can we focus on improving how the money is spent? So help me out here, but there's already an existing foundation, right? Which is mm -hmm. separate from a new, what we're talking about here, which is a new foundation. May I think I'm give you this one to answer. I'll take your questions though. <coughs> You're answering a lot of questions every day. Uh, for those who don't know, I'm the Ken Hayer, I'm the president of the Lakewood Hospital Foundation. Our sole mission, as you've heard me say before, is to support programs and services that are offered by the hospital. So our sole purpose right now is to support those programs and services. Most of them, if not all of them, in the last five years have been uh, what I would call outpatient-based services. Two examples are diabetes. We support over $350,000 a year to provide supplies and medicine for people that need that. We also help in uh, brain health and senior behavior. Those are needs that were needed in the past that we funded. Those are needs that we currently are funded today. And those are needs they're going to be needed to be funded in the future. 
So we are starting on the same process that this community is, is to how to eva you know, evaluate the different options. And, you know, it was mentioned this evening that there's a lot of different structures with governance and IRS regulations that are associated with that. So we have an interest in this community to support it on an ongoing basis. I've said that before. We're here and we want to continue to be here and support not just this community, but the communities around us. Because two thirds, <coughs> excuse me, two thirds of our donors live outside of this community too. Wow. I truly believe that having two foundations can work together in collaboration. But it takes a lot of time, a lot of effort as you've heard tonight. Right. And we have to be very de deliberate and work our way through this. Thank you. You get one more question. This speaks to how the funds are currently being used and how they're going to be used in the future. The question was, how much is the seminar leader being paid and who is paying him? She's asking, how am I being paid tonight? Mayor, you want to take this one? Sure. Uh, Mr. Cantor is being paid $2,000 for the work to help us organize this conversation and facilitate it and help follow the uh, process. Uh, our two uh, foundation members are here as volunteers. Uh, so speak to you about the so uh, you have green sheets of paper. So the green sheet of paper says, hey, here are some initial ideas, just initial ideas of things that might potentially be things for a new foundation to focus on. What you're being asked to do, and this is, Annette, again, a first place for each of you to have input into the process, what happens ultimately, to say, hey, what would be your five top choices of things for this new organization to focus on? Uh, there's also a space on the back there, on the very last box says a write-in option. If, no, if there are not enough options here that appeal to you, but something else is of concern to you, plop it in there. Uh, there'll be a basket here as you walk out the door to plop your green sheet in. So I'm going to give you a couple minutes to do that, and we're going to ask the mayor to make a few closing remarks, then we'll wrap up the evening. we we'll wrap up. Uh, we're a little ahead of schedule. That's great. I would say I would invite the trustees of the hospital association to come forward at the conclusion of this meeting, which will be momentarily, and if anybody has any questions of the trustees, this would be uh, an opportunity to address them. Uh, the, the next step in this process is undefined. We need to gather in, uh, what we've learned here. We're going to be able to look carefully at uh, the, the questions that were asked and the answers that you gave us and, uh, and decide uh, how we can best organize ourselves for the mission that's ahead. So uh, at this point in time, there is not another community meeting since this is the fourth one. City Council, however, has several meetings scheduled, just about every Monday night at 6 p.m. here in City Hall and one form or another. They have a variety of subjects that uh, they are addressing from uh, their view and their sense of responsibilities. So those are the committee meetings that are, uh, that are, that are uh, basically uh, the, the near-term schedule to engage in. Uh, I think we all have much to learn about and reflect on what we learned tonight, and I encourage you to do so. And I want to thank our panelists for sharing their wisdom. And I, I think we had a universal set of concerns and questions, and I think we got some really good direction. This is being videotaped, so we, uh, we can go back and, and watch it and listen, and we're going to do that. And uh, no doubt, uh, when uh, citizens convene to begin to formulate this new foundation, separate from the hospital foundation, they'll be able to watch this as well. So those folks who are not here, so you've, uh, you've, you've etched yourself in uh, the edifice of Lakewood's knowledge, and we're very grateful for that. So let's give a, a round of applause to our... To our Citizens, I thank you for coming out. Trustees, I would invite you to come forward. And citizens who have any questions uh, about other issues of 
the letter of intent or otherwise would be uh, welcome to, to put forward. So, class dismissed.